Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and to uh, talk to you about um, how chemical biology can uh, hopefully help you in your uh, NMR research. So um, the tutorial that I will present today is very much motivated by our own work um, on chromatin. So just a second. Um, so my group, we are, um, we are studying chromatin, which is really the functional form of the genome in the cell. And um, what chromatin does, it actually helps the cell uh, with two things. The first one uh, is that um, the DNA that the cell has, it's actually very long. It's about 3 billion base pairs. It's about two meters of DNA, and all of that DNA has to fit into a tiny, tiny nucleus, uh, which is only 10 micrometers in diameter. Um, and then the second problem that the cell has, in addition to packaging its DNA, is actually how can it do that in a way that actually makes sense so that uh, it can turn genes that are supposed to be on and turn off genes that are supposed to be off. So really chromatin is the solution to these two uh, big problems, which are how to pack a large amount of information in a tiny, tiny volume, and also how to access this information on demand. So on a molecular level, chromatin consists of these structures that are called nucleosomes. So we have 147 base pairs of DNA that's wrapped around a protein core so let me see if I can turn on my laser pointer. Okay, so we have 147 base pairs of DNA that are uh, wrapped around a protein core um, that consists of histone proteins. And this already provides a level of uh, compaction, a factor of seven of compaction of the, uh, of the genetic information. And then these nucleosomes kind of come together in these nucleosome arrays um, and they can be more compact or less compact depending on the context. So if we take a look at the nucleosome, we know, of course, the crystal structure of that uh, that was solved um, in 1997 by Caroline Luger and Tim Richmond. And so you will see uh, the core consists of these histone proteins. So there's four different types of histones. H3, H4, H2B, and H2A, and there's actually two copies of them. And um, we have this beautiful, well-ordered, organized core. Uh, of course, here's the DNA. Two, two, um, there's two. Um, it wraps around twice. But what uh, stands out is we have these uh, long tails of the, nuclear, of the histone proteins um, that are very important in gene regulation. So um, this is um, really um, the molecular level. Now the, on the nuclear level, if we take a look at chromatin, we will see in this, for example, electron micrograph of the nucleus, we will see that we actually have uh, two types of chromatin. So we have these uh, darkly stained regions of chromatin, which are called heterochromatin, and that's where silent genes are located. And then we have these um, lightly stained regions of chromatin that are called euchromatin, and that's where all the active genes are located. So the way we go from the molecular level to the nuclear level of chromatin organization is very complicated. There's a lot of gaps in our knowledge, but we do know that there are a lot of proteins that are involved in this process, and in particular, chromatin readers, writers, and erasers. And, um, so those are chromatin interacting proteins that um, have a, a really important effect on the molecular level. And then from this molecular level, we have uh, global implications on the nuclear level uh, for gene regulation and cell fate. So I wanted to give you this very quick background on chromatin research because um, I think um, hopefully on the next slides you will appreciate all the complexity of this system and um, all the tools that we need in order to actually study this system properly. So if we take a look at the nucleosome, right, so this is the crystal structure of the nucleosome, but the nucleosome really doesn't look like that in cells. 
In fact, in cells, um, the nucleosome is really very much decorated by a lot of different post-translational modifications. And so you can have um, acetylations, methylation, uh, phosphorylation, uh, other types of acetylations, and um, even ubiquitylation. And um, so really these post-translational modifications, they're very important for gene regulation. They're, they often are called epigenetic modifications because they determine the fate of a cell beyond even what's encoded in the, uh, in the DNA. So when you study chromatin, you really cannot study chromatin without uh, the histone post-translational modifications. But that really brings us to the question of how can we install post-translational modifications um, efficiently uh, in the context of our NMR experiments, right? Where we also have to do isotopic labeling and we are often uh, sample limited. So this is uh, motivation number one for this tutorial um, and for us really um, delving into chemical biology tools that can help us solve this problem. The second motivation for us is when we study chromatin interacting proteins, well, they're, they're kind of complicated. They're, um, for example, this um, heterochromatin protein, HP1 alpha, uh, interacts with chromatin that uh, has um, methylation on histone H3, lysine 9. And this protein is, um, it has two folded domains, but also has three unfolded domains. And um, on, in addition to this, this protein actually is very complicated biophysically because it often forms liquid droplets and gels. So we have this uh, very heterogeneous um, viscous system. And so the NMR spectra that we get, uh, this is a solid state NMR, um, magic angle spinning NMR spectrum, a carbon-carbon spectrum of this protein in the gel state. And um, you will see, you see how this, this looks like, right? We have uh, some resolution in some parts of the spectrum, but others, other parts are actually quite crowded. So ideally, we would like to have a tool that allows us to um, simplify these spectra, and in particular, segmental labeling uh, can be very helpful. So this is the second motivation for us. We really need tools um, from chemical biology that can help us uh, simplify uh, the, the information that we get in our NMR spectra while still keeping the proteins in their uh, native state without truncating them. And then the third motivation is um, um, a research topic in our group. So we are uh, really interested in developing targeted DNP for in-cell applications. So the idea is that we have our favorite protein in the cell, and then we have our DNP polarization agent, and we can target it specifically to that particular protein within the cellular environment which ideally will give us selective polarization. So uh, we will end up with uh, increasing our signal from that particular protein in the cell, but also it will give us selectivity as well because this will allow us to just enhance the signals of our favorite protein and not um, really from the cellular background. So in order to do this, um, we really need efficient biorthogonal chemical strategies that allow us to target these DNP biradicals to proteins of interest in the complex cellular environment. Okay, so this is the motivation. And um, I guess as an NMR spectroscopist talking to chemical biologists, uh, I can rephrase this motivation in three questions. So how do we install post-translational modifications efficiently in proteins in the context of isotopic labeling? What is the best way to segmentally or selectively label my favorite protein? And the third question is, how do we attach spectroscopic probes, in particular EPR, DNP, or paramagnetic relaxation enhancement probes on proteins efficiently and selectively? So, um, if you ask these questions to a chemical biologist, they will tell you, okay, these are the tools that I have to answer these questions. So the tools that we will cover today are cysteine chemistry, native chemical ligation, 
in teens, sortes, and amber, su amber suppression, or unnatural amino acid incorporation. So uh, this, uh, I guess, um, if you want to learn more and want to read a little bit more on this topic after this tutorial, um, um, a couple of years ago, together with my postdoctoral advisor, Tom Muir, we wrote a review um, on um, molecular engineering tools for the structural biologists. So really covering uh, these tools in the context of uh, NMR, cryo-EM, uh, crystallography. So, uh, so you can take a look. And um, I do want to uh, put a disclaimer out there. Uh, it is impossible for me to cover all um, the applications of these tools in NMR spectroscopy. Um, there's a lot of work that a lot of groups all over the world are doing in developing these tools or applying them to uh, their uh, research. And uh, so my apologies if I have missed your favorite NMR or can buy your application or paper, but please feel free to share either at the end or um, I can start a thread on Twitter where you can post your favorite um, application of intines or sortes or, um, you know, all of these tools in the context of uh, NMR uh, spectroscopy. Okay, so um, I, before we start, maybe I'll pause here for a second and see if there's any uh, urgent questions. Or um, I, I actually, I don't see anything in the Q&A, um, but I don't know, one of the hosts can, can tell me if there's anything I need to address at this point. Oh, you muted. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see anything from my side. Uh, therefore, I think we can probably move on. Uh, if there are any questions appeared, uh, we, we could pause to address okay. those questions. Yeah. I just so, want to make sure that I pause yes. time. And also Thank for you. all the attendees, uh, if you have uh, questions, you can always submit your questions in the Q&A channel at any time. Okay, great. So let's get going. Um, so the first tool that we will talk about is um, cysteine. So I call it the golden cysteine because pretty much you will see it on almost every slide I have <laughs> for the rest of the presentation. So cysteines are the chemical biologists best friends um, and the reason for that is um, first of all they're relatively rare in proteins so they're about they're less than 2% abundant in proteins, so relatively unique compared to all the other amino acids that uh, our proteins have. And they really have unique chemical reactivity compared to other amino acids. In particular, they are the best nucleophile that proteins have um, that, can, that is often used um, in the catalytic activity of proteins, but also uh, that chemical biologists can take advantage of. And another great advantage for cysteines, uh, especially as chemical tools, is that they're really reactive under protein-friendly conditions, meaning uh, we can target them at uh, reasonable you know, physiological temperatures, we can target them in water, um, and um, reasonable pH, neutral pH, where our protein can even still remain folded while we are doing chemistry on it. Um, and for us as NMR spectroscopists, one really great advantage of cysteines is that anything we do with cysteines is actually compatible with uniform isotopic labeling. So we can take our protein, we can make it in bacteria, we can add N15, C13 labels, and then we can take this protein that's already uniformly labeled and do the chemistry that we need to do. Um, after that, so uh, we have this uh, labeled protein that's visible by NMR. So there are actually a lot of things that you can do with cysteines. Um, some of them are probably more familiar to you, some of them less. Um, so uh, of course we can use cysteines to build disulfide bonds. Um, we can use them to attach uh, spectroscopic probes. Uh, probably less familiar to some of the students is that uh, we can also take cysteines and make methylation mimics. So very useful for introducing uh, post-methylation uh, as a post-translational modification in proteins. 
Um, and also what I really like about them, my favorite kind of chemistry on, on cysteines is when we can take a cysteine and actually turn them into other amino acids, which can be very, very helpful in some contexts. So, um, and then uh, just a few disadvantages, I guess. Um, first of all, obviously, when you work with cysteines, um, often what people do is they, if there's any native cysteine, they will turn that into a serine or alanine and then uh, put a cysteine somewhere else so they can attach the, for example, their EPR probe or PRE probe. So that, of course, works well. Uh, unless you have cysteines in there that your protein really wants and you cannot um, mutate them out. So when we work with histones, we are actually very lucky because uh, histones, they don't have, um, only H3 has a native cysteine and uh, we can turn that into a serine or alanine. And so for all purposes for our research, we can think of uh, histones as cysteine free, which allows, allows us to put a cysteine wherever we want. But then we work with other proteins, for example, a, this heterochromatin protein HP1 alpha, which I mentioned earlier. And this protein has several cysteines and actually you cannot remove them. They need to be there for the protein to be folded properly and to do its function. So uh, in that context, we cannot do that much with cysteine chemistry. Um, and then another disadvantage of cysteines is if you wanted to target something in cells, well, cysteines are not suitable for that because cells have a lot of cysteines, so there's no selectivity in that. So you cannot really uh, target your favorite protein inside the cell just based on cysteine chemistry. Okay, so now let's go over a few applications of cysteines uh, and a little bit of the chemistry. So uh, probably the one thing that's very familiar to all of you working with proteins is that um, cysteines, they like to make disulfide bonds. And so this is actually very easy. You just need a slightly basic pH and um, access to oxygen or air, really. So if you just made a protein solution and you put it on the bench top and you leave it for a little bit and you have cysteines in there, you're probably going to form disulfide bonds. And the way we deal with this, obviously, uh, as we purify our proteins, we often add um, TCEP or DTT or some uh, reducing agent to prevent the proteins from doing this. But sometimes you may want to uh, actually build those disulfide bonds uh, in a selective way because um, obviously sometimes they're really necessary for your protein to fold correctly. Um, but often you can also use this to, um, to connect two proteins together. So for example, often uh, ubiquitination, ubiquitin is attached to other proteins using this disulfide chemistry. Uh, and sometimes they're also used to attach spectroscopic probes. So when you uh, think about using disulfides to connect to proteins or attach something to your protein, you have to be aware of uh, the selectivity issue. So let's say, for example, we have two proteins, protein A and protein B, and we want to build a disulfide bond between them. So if you just leave those two proteins, the disulfide bond uh, will form for you, but you will end up with uh, what you want. So protein A attached to protein B, but also you will end up with protein A attached to protein A and protein B attached to protein B. So, uh, so there's this selectivity issue. So you will lose a lot of your you know, proteins, uh, they will form these non-productive or non-interesting uh, homodimers instead of the heterodimer, which is what you might be interested in. So how can we uh, overcome this issue? Um, so you cannot get rid of it completely, but there are ways to kind of bias your chemistry so that you make more uh, of this heterodimer complex. So the way I did this, um, in my postdoctoral research was um, the following way. So what I actually wanted to do was I wanted to attach ubiquitin to histone H2B because I wanted to study the effect of H2B ubiquitination on chromatin structure. And so in order to do this, I used a disulfide and I call this an asymmetric disulfide. So uh, actually I used the disulfide to connect the, the C-terminus of ubiquitin to lysine 120 uh, 
on to position 120 on H2B. So that was no longer lysine, but I put there cysteine. Um, and what I also want to do was I want to make this segmentally labeled in the sense that I only wanted to focus on ubiquitin by NMR. I, uh, so I had this ubiquitin N15 labeled while the histones uh, were at natural abundance. So, um, so I wanted to use this disulfide to build this segmentally labeled histone um, H2B ubiquitin um, construct. So the way I did this was the following. So the, uh, the first aspect of this was actually adding a tile group on the ubiquitin side. So I use this with an intine, and we'll talk about this reaction in a few slides. I just want to introduce it here. So I used uh, the help of an intine, then I um, added this um, aminoethane tile, and the intine helped me attach it to the C-terminus of ubiquitin. So I had my tile here where I could use this to build a disulfide bond. But more interesting for this particular slide is how I dealt with H2B to make this reaction more, re uh, more selective. So what I did here was um, I had my uh, H2B, which was at natural abundance, and at position 120, where normally you would find a lysine, um, I put a cysteine residue. And so then um, what I did was I actually used an aromatic tile um, at lower pH. I attached this aromatic tile to this um, a cysteine. And so um, this aromatic tile acts, um, has two purposes. The first one is actually protects this disulfide, uh, this, this cysteine here and prevents it from forming uh, homodimers. So it prevents it from forming uh, h to b h to b dimers and then it's also um, in a way activates this so you can attach it at low ph and then you can just mix these two guys at higher ph and then um, this uh, prevents h to b h to b dimers uh, this tile is actually not as reactive so you don't get as many ubiquitin ubiquitin dimers um, but you bias the reaction so that you end up more with this um, uh, heterodimer, which is what you want. So it's just really taking advantage of aromatic tiles, which have lower pKa, so they're much more reactive at higher pH, pH 7, so they, they basically, um, um, you know, allow you to, in a way, bias the reaction so that you end up more with this heterodimer rather than the homodimer. Um, okay, so um, Another thing that you can do with cysteines, and you're probably quite familiar with this, is just using uh, some type of malamide chemistry or some type of malamide, um, uh, malamide attached to your favorite probe um, to do an alkylation reaction on cysteines. So here the star uh, malamide is this, this guy over here, and the star can be anything. It can be a fluorescent probe, it can be an EPR probe, um, either something that has a metal uh, or a nitroxide, it can be a PRE probe, or it can even be a DNP biradical. Um, and so uh, here I just want to highlight a DNP application of this technology from the Cortilius group. Um, so there they were interested in targeting or uh, doing targeted DNP on ubiquitin. Um, so they substituted uh, this alanine with the cysteine, and there's also the second position here where they put a cysteine. Um, and um, they, they also developed this uh, gadolinium dota um, uh, polarization agent, which uh, was attached to malamide. And so you, they used this malamide alkylation reaction to attach this to the cysteine in uh, their favorite cysteine in ubiquitin. Um, so, uh, of course, this reaction was done in vitro. So this is not in-cell targeted DNP because you cannot, as I mentioned, target the cysteines in cells. Um, and they also actually had a disulfide version uh, of a different uh, gadolinium complex. So they, they really took advantage of cysteine chemistry to target their pol uh, polarization agents at uh, the specific location on ubiquitin. Um, okay, so now um, a, sec a third reaction, I guess, that's very useful is um, uh, 
using cysteines to create methylation mimics. And that's again an alkylation reaction. And so what you do here is you start with the cysteine and then you alkylate the cysteine and you attach um, you know, groups like this. And I'll show you their reagents that allow you to do, um, basically you can do no methylation, you can do monomethylation. So just attach one methyl group uh, you can attach two methyl groups or three methyl groups. And so here you can see the, uh, the mimic compared to the native uh, lysine residue. So they're the same length, but of course here you have a sulfur group. So um, the sulfur group um, is, can, can affect your chemistry a little bit or how proteins recognize this, uh, this methyl mark. So it is very important that you do, bi if you're studying this uh, or using this for uh, NMR experiments, it is very important to actually test uh, the binding of your uh, methyl binding protein to your substrate, uh, just to make sure that it still can bind. So um, for example, we use this a lot when we, um, when we make um, H3K9 trimethylated nucleosomes because this allows us to actually just prepare the protein in uh, bacteria and then do the chemistry on this um, isotopically labeled protein and allows us to just really obtain a lot of material basically. So we do, we do it for efficiency. And our H3 protein, um, we know that has been characterized that it can still recognize this methylation mimic um, the KD is slightly higher compared to um, the native residue, so there is some effect on binding, um, but um, it's not very large. So, um, so, so again, um, there are a lot of advantages to this approach if you're an NMR spectroscopist, but of course, always I want to emphasize that always one should do the relevant control experiments and just make sure that these mimics really um, still support the biological function of uh, the protein. Um, so um, yeah, so very useful reaction in particular if you have, uh, if you can, uh, if you have methylation that you want to study. And uh, finally, um, my favorite reactions of uh, cysteines where we can take cysteine and turn it into another amino acid. So uh, they're called desulfurization reactions. And probably the most common reaction you will see out there is taking a cysteine and turning it into an alanine. Um, and you will see in a couple of slides why this is actually very, very helpful. So just remember this desulfurization reaction, cysteine going into an alanine. Uh, and there are other uh, strategies out there where you can turn it also into uh, or you can take some tile containing um, amino acid and turn it into a native residue. And they, they can be very helpful uh, when, you, when you're doing uh, chemistry on proteins. Um, but I, uh, so I guess here, um, what I uh, have is the tail of H4. So H4 doesn't actually have any cysteines. And um, so when we prepare, for example, acetylated H4, um, using native chemical ligation, which I will show you in a couple of slides, we uh, have to introduce a cysteine. Usually I introduce it here at position 38, but because I don't, H4 doesn't have native cysteines, um, I can do um, a desulfurization reaction just like this one and turn it into an alanine. And if I've chosen my position of the cysteine wisely, um, I would have chosen a position where I natively had alanine. <laughs> so I can turn the cysteine into the native alanine residue. And so I can build these acetylated proteins without a cysteine scar. Um, so with the completely native sequence. And you will see in a couple of slides uh, what tool I use to build those. Okay, so, um, but so my dream really is to take cysteine and not just be able to turn it into an alanine, but also turn it into any amino acid I want, because that will make, you know, using chemical biology tools so, so much easier and so, so much uh, better in the context of native uh, sequences. 
So uh, chemical biologists are also working very hard on this problem. It's not just my dream, but it's the dream of a lot of people. Um, so I wanted to highlight here uh, one approach, which is uh, you can take cysteine and actually turn it into this dehydroalanine. So you have this double bond here. Uh, and then you can take this dehydroalanine and target it with all sorts of uh, uh, reagents, and you can build um, all sorts of natural or unnatural amino acids based off of this. So you can um, just put, make it into, turn it into a leucine, um, all sorts of unnatural versions of the leucine. Uh, you can turn it into an arginine or lysine or whatever you want. So um, this was. Uh, this, this is actually um, from Ben uh, Davis's lab, published in 2016. So it sounds amazing, right? It's, it's an amazing tool, but actually what turns out is once you build this dehydroalanine and then you target it with whatever you want, you lose the stereochemistry of the amino acid, so side chain. So uh, unfortunately, you end up with both L and D ver versions here. But, um, you know, it's, it's a great start and I know a lot of people are thinking along these uh, types of problems and uh, keep an eye out. I'm pretty sure, you know, there, there will be a lot of uh, exciting uh, cis shape-shifting cysteine reactions um, coming out in the near future. Um, and if I've missed your favorite one, please uh, do uh, share at the end of, uh, of the talk. Okay, so um, I think this um, kind of like ends our overview of cysteine, but keep in mind these cysteine reactions because they'll come again and again. So uh, the second tool that we can use to build interesting proteins um, is native chemical ligation. So in native chemical ligation, we can take two polypeptides um, and they can be both synthetic or recombinant, depending on what we want to do. And the key is that the first polypeptide um, needs to have a thioester at the end. So there is this C-terminal thioester. On the other hand, the second polypeptide needs to start with the cysteine. So you, have, you need this N-terminal cysteine here. So in native chemical ligation, you take these two components and you put them together. Um, and they react with each other. So in particular, the cysteine side chain can attack the carbonyl here. Um, and um, what happens is a, a reaction called transthioesterification, where this peptide now hangs off of the cysteine side chain. So this is the cysteine side chain, and you can see now we've attached this first polypeptide uh, onto the cysteine side chain. Um, and then we, um, we have um, basically an, a rearrangement. So this so-called S to N acyl shift, where um, this rearranges into a native peptide bond. So now your first polypeptide and the second polypeptide are connected together into a much longer polypeptide chain. Um, and um, we have... Uh, we, we have our native polypeptide, or we have our native uh, peptide bond over here. Um, so now if you didn't want this cysteine here, you absolutely need it in order to carry out the reaction. But just like in my H4 case where I didn't have, uh, I don't want to have native cysteines in there, I don't want to have cysteines in there, we can do a desulfurization reaction and turn this cysteine into an, uh, an alanine. So we can end up with this native uh, linkage over here. Um, so we don't leave any scars. So native chemical ligation, um, this is what it does. It basically takes two polypeptides and puts them together into a long, a long protein. So what can you do with this reaction? So what I did, for example, during my postdoctoral studies, I used this reaction a lot in order to decorate the tail of uh, histone H4 with different post-translational modifications. So in this case, I used um, a synthetic uh, piece that I did by peptide synthesis. So these are residues 1 to 37 of H4. And uh, this allows you, if you do this by synthesis, you can introduce post-translational modifications anywhere you want um, in a well-defined way. 
Um, and then also by peptide synthesis, you can generate uh, thioester at the end of this peptide. Then on the other hand, you can make the rest of H4 with a cysteine at position 38 recombinantly. So this can be made in bacteria. And then you can do this native chemical ligation and desulfurization, and you can end up with this polyacetylated H4, uh, which is completely native. Um, there's no, uh, no weird residues in there, there's no cysteines, um, and it, it carries all these modifications. So um, some advantages of this technique are that um, it really allows you to build post-translationally modified proteins very precisely. Um, and it's also a good way for you to introduce multiple modifications. So there aren't many techniques out there that allow you to introduce multiple acetylations, for example. Um, you can also use it to install selective isotopic labels uh, at well-defined positions. And I'll show an example of that on the next slide. And it can be somewhat compatible with isotopic labeling in bacteria. So for example, if you wanted to study the effect of acetylation, on the rest of H4, there's nothing preventing you from uh, making this piece isotopically labeled because you're making it in uh, bacteria. Some disadvantages of this technique, however, that, they're, that it is quite expensive for, uh, at least as far as NMR is concerned. So you can see here, right, you can, um, you know, my yields in a way. So I started with 2.5 mg of everything, ended up with 0.5 mg um, of final product. So you do lose a lot when you uh, put those pieces together. Um, and this technique is really more suitable for C-terminal or N-terminal modifications. And it is hard to label the full protein, obviously, because it's just expensive to make peptides that are fully labeled and have post-translational modifications. And one thing that, you know, I didn't appreciate <laughs> until I started talking more to people who don't do these types of things very often is that actually it requires HPLC purification. So in my group, we use HPLC a lot, but that's not always um, uh, found actually in biochemistry labs. So, um, so it is something that, you know, uh, kind of it's, you know, people have to get used to. Um, and of course, if you do HPLC purification, for those of you who do that, you know that you have to lyophilize your material and then you have to refold it. So you, you can only do this with proteins that can be refolded, uh, obviously. If your protein cannot be refolded, there's no point doing this technique. Um, okay, so this um, is uh, native chemical ligation. And so here I want to highlight an example from Mei Hong's lab where they um, use native chemical ligation to make um, a 71 residue um, version of the M2 peptide. Um, and uh, they introduced a selective label. So they made this red piece uh, separately as one peptide. And then they made this blue piece separately as a different peptide. And they introduced labels of these underlined amino acids. So this alanine was isotopically labeled, this G and I, uh, and these guys over here. So and then they used native chemical ligation to put this uh, together and study this uh, using solid state NMR. So this is an example of where this technique can allow you to build relatively long uh, polypeptides where you can introduce isotopic labels in a well-defined way, right? So not all, you don't label all isoleucines, but you just label that particular one that's interesting. Um, so that's the advantage of this technique. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of native chemical ligation. Uh, and now let's talk about intines. So intines are um, really cool, really amazing proteins um, that exist in uh, unicellular organisms. And what they do is, uh, so usually they're found kind of like embedded within a polypeptide chain. And so uh, intin refers to internal protein and extin refers to external protein. But for the purposes of today's tutorial, um, whenever I say extin, think of my favorite protein that I want to make for NMR. Okay, so, um, so in unicellular organisms, you will often find intines kind of embedded 
within um, the sequence of uh, an extein. And what the intein can do is basically it can splice itself out, remove itself out, and in the process build a native peptide bond between this part of the sequence and this part of the sequence. So you end up with your full extein protein and the intein just swims away. So these are the so-called contiguous inteins because we also have uh, split inteins, also found in unicellular organisms, where you can have um, um, the intein now is not one full sequence, but it's split into N parts and N part and C part. And so what the organism makes uh, first or concurrently, you have it makes this polypeptide chain where a part of your extein and part of your intein are together. And then it makes a second polypeptide chain where part of the intein and the extein are also together. And so in the cell, um, these two parts can find each other and the inteins can come together and they uh, associate with each other in a non-covalent way, usually using electrostatic interactions. Uh, and they fold properly and the intein can still splice itself out and basically connect this n extein part to the c extein part, giving you a full length protein of interest. And the intein uh, components actually swim away. They're still non-covalently bound. Um, and so inteins also have this, like when I say the c intein and the n intein come together, whether they come together as two split parts or whether they're just the contiguous intein, they always fold in the same way. Um, so they have this typical horseshoe uh, type of fold. So um, independent of whether they're split or contiguous, they can always adopt the same structure, which I think is really cool. Um, okay, so in teams, so what can they do for us? Um, so um, some of their advantages or what I, uh, the reason why I really like them, they're nature's protein building tools. I mean, so you have this ideal situation where you have one polypeptide and another polypeptide and you can put them together and build bigger proteins. Um, they're also exceptionally selective. So if you want to put two pieces together um, in the cell, for example, you know, the two intein pieces will find each other and will react, will, will associate in a very selective way. So um, actually inteins are really a really good tool to put together proteins in the cell if you wanted to do that and people have done that. Um, and they're very much compatible with labeling strategies in bacteria. So we'll go over that in, uh, in a second. Um, so what can we do with inteins? Well, we can use them to make segmentally labeled proteins. We can use them to introduce post translational modifications uh, people often use them to make cyclic protein or peptide libraries. Um, and uh, you can also use them for tagless protein purification. So I'll go over some of these applications again in a second. Um, and some of the disadvantages are that, um, well, cysteine, uh, inteins um, mostly use cysteine chemistry. So you will have a cysteine scar uh, in your protein. Um, obviously, once you start segmentally labeling your protein, you go from making one protein to making two proteins, there's extra purifications involved, so you will end up with reduced yields of your favorite protein. Um, and sometimes inteins may be incompatible with your protein purification protocol, or they may not give you good expression of your protein, so it is certainly something that uh, happens from time to time. Okay, so now let's talk about how inteins work because I, I often get questions about, you know, inteins versus sortes. So I think it's important to kind of realize what the mechanism of these, of, of, of the, what the chemical mechanism is so that um, you can appreciate um, the, you know, the, the differences between all of them. Uh, and I guess I should speed up a little bit because we are already uh, about 45 minutes in. Um, okay, so what is important here for inteins to carry their chemistry is that we have uh, three important residues. 
The first one is this first cysteine uh, on the intein, and then there's the last asparagine on the intein. So these residues come with the intein, and you don't have to worry about them. The residue that you need and you have to worry about is this first residue here on your C extein. So this has to be a cysteine, serine, or threonine, depending on which intein you're using. Most often it has to be a cysteine. Okay, so the way this works is um, we have this first cysteine here that comes from the intein. Um, it uh, attacks the carbonyl, the side chain uh, SH attacks the carbonyl over here. And so this extein now um, moves from the backbone to the side chain of the cysteine. So basically, typical reaction, you've seen it on the previous slides, um, the cysteine side chain kind of connects to a piece, a polypeptide piece. But then the second part is where the cysteine from your favorite protein comes in. And actually, uh, it does something called linear trans, uh, uh, it does a trans esterification step where it attacks this carbonyl over here. And now this extine is going to move from this cysteine to this cysteine over here. So um, it's still hanging off the side chain, but it, it, is, um, um, moved, it has moved to a different cysteine. And so this here is called the branched intermediate, and it's really cool. Take a look at this. You have this carbon over here, and from this carbon, you have three polypeptides connected. So one is one part of your extine, then you have this um, part over here, and then pretty much the intein is hanging off of this side. And so up to this point, all these steps are reversible. But once you get to the branched intermediate, that's where you, know, you reach your rate limiting uh, step. Because in order to resolve this branch intermediate, that's, you, know, you need to do some, um, some um, different type of chemistry. So here, this, this asparagine, this residue from the intein, finally comes into play. And this uh, side chain attacks the backbone um, and basically allows the intein to disconnect itself from the branched intermediate. So you end up with two things. You disconnect your extein with the part of the protein still hanging off the side chain, but this is very easy. It can rearrange back to um, a, a normal backbone. Um, and then uh, this, the intein on the other side ends up with this uh, succinamide intermediate, but that can be easily hydrolyzed and you end up with your uh, native asparagine side chain over here. Okay, so this branched intermediate is, as I said, this step over here is the slow step. So if you've ever heard, oh, inteins are very slow, they don't work as well. Well, the reason for that is because we, um, um, it's, it's this particular step over here. And so uh, here I had the crystal structure of the branched intermediate. I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Um, so here I have compiled um, a table of some useful intines for those of you who might be thinking about using them. Um, so they have all sorts of different properties um, that might be more or less desirable. Um, but if you are a novice into this and you're looking into uh, segmentally labeling your protein, so how does segmental labeling work, first of all? Well, it's very easy. You use split intines and you make um, um, this construct separately in bacteria, and then you make this construct separately in bacteria. And because you make them separately and you make them in bacteria, you can isotopically label them any way you want. So for example, you can isotopically label this piece, but not this one. And then you'll end up with the, um, once you let the intines do their job, you'll end up with a segmentally labeled uh, protein of interest, um, where only part of the protein is visible by NMR, but you still have the full length sequence, which allows, you, uh, allows it to, to fold properly. Um, so if you're a novice at this and you really need uh, to isotopically label your protein, uh, I highly recommend that you uh, start with the CFA-GP intein. So um, here are the references, so you can take a look at those. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about, I don't have time to tell you why this is much better than all the other intins, but what you need to know is that um, this intin actually works uh, at higher temperatures, also works in three molar guanidinium um, and up to eight molar urea. So you can um, really do the chemistry that you need in proteins that are not very well behaved and you need to work with them under, um, um, under denaturing conditions. Um, and also unlike any other protein out there, any other intine or even sortase, um, this protein only needs a cysteine on your, um, on your uh, extine. So once you're done with the ligation, you're just going to have an extra cysteine in your uh, sequence. And if, you, if you're smart with the way you chose it, you can even do a desulfurization reaction and get rid of it. So, uh, so that's really exciting about uh, this particular intein is that it's the most promiscuous intein we have, um, one of the most efficient ones, and it really works under conditions where as protein chemists, we often have to work with uh, denaturants and things like that. Um, so, and here I want to highlight an application from Rob Tico's group, where they use this CFA intin to uh, label a protein called uh, FUS. So um, you can see this FUS sequence is really a nightmare for any NMR structural biologist because it is basically the same type of amino acids. They're serines and um, tyrosines and some glycines, but it's, it's a very um, uh, low complexity sequence. And so what they did here was they, they used uh, the intin to label the first 112 residues and then uh, also prepared the second version where they labeled um, residues 113 to 214. Um, and so for example, you can see the first part has a lot of CP signal, very little inept. Um, the second part has very little CP signal, a lot of inept. So that kind of really helped them uh, with assignment and also confirm uh, you know, that you know, this part contained the structured core of the fibers while this part here contained the, um, the um, disordered or more mobile part of the protein in the amyloid version. Okay, so um, again, um, you can use intines also to generate thioesters, um, and um, that allows you then to take this thioester and ligate it to other peptides. Um, so I am going to skip this for the sake of time, uh, but here is a, a, a reference of this if you are interested. Um, and so, um, so for example, this is how I, um, I use this intine. Um, to I used it basically to generate uh, this thioester uh, version of uh, ubiquitin. Um, and then uh, I do want to mention tagless protein purification, which is a really cool application of intines. So here you basically take your uh, protein of interest, it's attached to an intine, and then you have some sort of uh, affinity tag. So for example, it can be a histidine or um, um, a his tag or flag tag or whatever you want. Um, and then you can pass this through um, an affinity column and you can do basically affinity purification where this construct will attach itself to uh, the protein, uh, to the column. And then you can use a little bit of uh, basic pH. And what happens is you can hydrolyze the extine from the intine. And now you end up with your protein of interest that's swimming in solution and has absolutely no tags attached to it. So basically you don't have to use tap cleavage to remove your his tag you know, the intein does that for you. So this is kind of a, a really cool application of intines that makes, uh, in some cases, makes protein purification very easy. There's no need for reverse nickel purification or anything like that here. You just, you know, collect your uh, extine and you're good to go. Um, okay, so these are about, this is, um, this concludes my section on intines. Uh, now, of course, often people ask, okay, but what about sortes? So when can I use intines and when can I use sortes? So uh, sortes, um, first of all, is a slightly different way of how you use it. 
So the intein is usually attached to your favorite protein, while sortase is a protein that you make separately. So you have to make this sortase protein recombinantly. Um, and then you make um, this um, first segment of your protein. So again, it can be synthetically made or recombinantly made. And then you uh, have to, to um, attach to it this kind of recognition sequence, this LPXTGXX motif, where X is any amino acid you want. Um, and then you make the second segment where um, this has to start with this recognition sequence, basically five glycines. Uh, and then you put the three components together and what sortase does, it recognizes this sequence and recognizes this sequence, uh, brings them together and puts them together and kicks out this uh, GXX motif. So you end up with your protein um, kind of ligated together. Um, so some advantages of this technique are that um, it is again compatible with synthetic or recombinant segments. It is also, just like intines, exceptionally selective. You have these recognition sequences and only those recognition sequences are going to react, especially if you have a complex mixture. And it is very much compatible with labeling strategies in bacteria. Um, so um, things that you can do with sortes are kind of similar to what you can do with intines. You can use it to make segmentally labeled proteins, introduce post-translational modifications, uh, attach proteins to solid support or bacterial cell walls. So in fact, sortase, its natural function is to build cell walls. Uh, and also you can use it to build cyclic protein and, or peptide libraries. Um, and then some of the disadvantages, however, are that um, the ligation leaves a large scar. So you need these nine residues over here. Um, they, they're left over after your ligation. Uh, another peculiar thing about sortase is that actually the ligation is reversible, and I'll show you on the next slide why. Um, and it also um, requires calcium. So um, this may or may not be a problem for your ligation. And actually there are now um, uh, sortase versions that are less dependent on, on calcium. Uh, so here is the crystal structure of uh, the sortase. You can see the calcium here. It actually makes this loop less uh, dynamic. And here you can see this LPXT uh, part of the peptide. And actually, sortase also uses cysteine chemistry to carry out the reaction. Uh, but so let me just show you why this reaction is reversible. So you can start with your first segment that has the LPXT GXX motif. And this, uh, the sortase will use a catalytic cysteine residue uh, to attach it. So again, it's hanging off this um, cysteine side chain. And then you have the second peptide comes in um, and um, attacks this, um, this bond over here and basically attaches itself. However, um, notice the final product still has the recognition motif. So the recognition motif being LPXTGXX, whatever. So the problem is that you still have that recognition motif and there's nothing preventing this guy to come back here and basically do the chemistry again. So you end up with these kind of futile reversible cycles for sortes. So unless you add one component in big excess or uh, find a way to remove your ligated product, um, you will end up with, um, you know, just the reaction going over and over again without giving you necessarily new, new uh, product. So that's something to keep in mind uh, with, uh, with sortes. Um, okay, so that I'm almost, well, this is the last tool we will talk about. And I apologize, I am um, going slower than I thought. Um, so, Amber suppression um, is a technique that allows us to introduce a natural amino acids, um, but without doing much chemistry on the protein. In fact, we can persuade either bacterial cells or mammalian cells to do the chemistry for us. So the way it works is um, we first um, decide where we want to put the natural amino acid <clears throat> and substitute that uh, native codon in the sequence with the uh, UAG codon, 
which is often called uh, an amber codon. So this is where the amber suppression comes from. Uh, and it is um, uh, also, um, I guess, um, it's also used uh, as a stop codon um, by cells. So, uh, however, this is how we tell the cell we want to put here something different at that particular position. And so now in order to do this, the ribosome needs a tRNA that has a complementary sequence to this codon and that also carries your natural amino acid. So in order to supply this tRNA, you also need to give the cells this um, amino acid tRNA synthetase that is specific to your unnatural amino acid and orthogonal, meaning that it doesn't recognize any of the amino acids of, um, of the native amino acid. Uh, so you also give the cells this amino acid tRNA synthetase and the tRNA, and then uh, you also have to give them the unnatural amino acid, of course. So this uh, protein loads the unnatural amino acid onto your tRNA, and then uh, the ribosome, when it reaches this UAG uh, codon, normally would interpret it as a stop codon, but now because you have a matching tRNA, it will actually go ahead and insert this unnatural amino acid at that particular position. So you end up with a polypeptide that's made in cells that carries your unnatural amino acid. And so the advantages of this technique is that it works in living cells. Um, it is bioorthogonal, um, meaning that it does the chemistry in the context of basically any other chemistry you want the cell does, uh, and also works really well in the presence of cysteines. Um, so what you can do with amber suppression is you can use it to install post-translational modifications, you can use it to install cross-linkers, fluorescent probes, EPR and PRE probes, um, and you can also use it to target proteins in complex environments. Some of the disadvantages are that it gives you low yields, um, and especially in labeled media. Um, and you have to deal with some truncation products um, that you need to purify out if you are doing this, if you're extracting the protein and purifying it. Um, and um, the really time consuming aspect of this is actually engineering these uh, synthetases. So you have to have a dedicated pair for every amino, uh, every unnatural amino acid you want. And so um, engineering those takes time. Um, and also the technique right now can really be used efficiently only to install one modification. Um, so you cannot use it to install multiple modifications. Um, and so here I just want to give you uh, kind of a, a view of the types of amino acids that you can install. So you can use it to install post-translational modifications, for example, uh, phosphorylated serine or acetylated lysine. Uh, people have developed tRNA synthetases to install uh, different spectroscopic probes. So for example, fluorinated tyrosine, um, this uh, nitroxide labeled lysine over here for PRE or EPR, uh, this HQA um, amino acid here, which uh, binds metals and can serve as PRE agent. I have used this to install crosslinkers. Uh, and uh, also in my group, we often uh, use it to install bioorthogonal handles on the protein. So these are uh, lysines that uh, contain these uh, cyclooctene or um, norbonine groups that can react selectively with tetrazines. So this allows us to carry cargo to the protein um, very selectively and efficiently and bioorthogonally. Um, so in order to do this, all you need is uh, two plasmids, one carrying your protein of interest with the um, uh, UAG stop codon insert or the tag uh, stop codon inserted wherever you want. And then you need a plasmid that carries the tRNA and the tRNA synthetase, and then you, ha you have to supply your natural amino acid. Um, and so uh, usually you want these two plasmids to have separate antibiotic resistance and also that they're inducible separately. Um, so either one by IPTG, the other one, for example, by ar Arabinos. Um, so here's an example from my own group where we have used this technique in a lot of different ways. So this is introducing this norbornine lysine. So um, 
Um, so when you do this, you always have to uh, do uh, basically a control where you don't supply the unnatural amino acid just to make sure that uh, you're not making the protein using the natural amino acids in your protein. Um, and so you can see that you know, in some cases we do get lower efficiency compared to the wild type. In other cases, for example, for this HP1 protein, we actually have pretty good uh, expression uh, with the unnatural amino acid in there, very comparable to wild type. Um, and then in the case of this SMC here, you can see actually we end up with truncation products. So you still make the truncation product even in the absence of the unnatural amino acid. That's because in that case, the ribosome um, actually interprets this, the stop codon as a stop codon. And so it basically stops the synthesis there um, and do doesn't have any amino acid to insert and just stops um, you know, protein, uh, the, the protein at that particular position. Um, okay, so um, some practical consideration is that um, you need careful optimization of the expression conditions because the cells, after all, they need to make two proteins. So you have to optimize the expression of the tRNA synthetase and also the expression of your protein of interest. Um, in my group, we have noticed or uh, learned the hard way that if you use a rabinose and you want to do C13 labeling, um, you'll end up with isotope scrambling. Um, and if you're having trouble with this, um, it might be because you have to shift the position of the unnatural amino acid somewhere else. So some constructs, depending on where you put the unnatural amino acid, might be easier to make compared to others. Um, and you always need the control experiment and mass spec to confirm that actually you really installed your unnatural amino acid and not the natural amino acid in that position. Um, okay, so I am just going to finish with highlighting the way we've used this technique in my group. So we use it for targeted DNP um, with the idea that we can do this in cells or cell lysates. So we install uh, the norbornene lysine amino acid on ubiquitin, for example. So you have this biorthogonal handle here. And then we also made a biradical polar polarization agent um, that's, uh, that's Totopol, for those of you who are familiar with this, and that's attached to tetrazine. So tetrazine and norbornene, they will find each other in the cell and they will react very selectively. So they do not react with anything else that the cell might have, they just react with each other. So this is what's called biorthogonal conjugation. Um, and then uh, you end up with a construct that looks like this. So now your totopol or DNP polarization agent is attached to your favorite protein uh, wherever you want it. And it doesn't matter whether you have cysteines or not on the protein. So you can do this very selectively because you have this very selective chemistry between norbornene and uh, tetrazine. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to skip this just to show, I want to show you some DNP data, but um, for the sake of time, uh, I'll just summarize. So some things are very clear uh, as a care from these chemical biologists. So if you want to do methylation, the best way for you is to start with cysteine-based mimics, um, but do, uh, you know, do proper controls. If you want to do segmental labeling, I highly recommend that you start with the CFA GP in teen and give it a try. If you want to install specific labels, isotopic labels, you may want to try native chemical ligation. Um, and if you want to target uh, some type of spectroscopic probe in the presence of cysteines, I recommend giving amber suppression uh, a try. Um, and some things that, you know, keep in mind, I think there's a lot of exciting research going on uh, in the intine and sortase field. So new and improved intines and sortase are coming your way. Um, I'm sure of that. Um, one thing that we need to work on and we are working on also in my group is improving our amber suppression in the context of isotopic labeling. There are some challenges there that we're trying to address. Um, also something that I'm really excited for the future is turning cysteine into other amino acids. And of course, using all of these tools to do NMR and chemical biology in living cells. And with this, I would like to thank my group 
Um, so they have been amazing and they're all experts in using these tools. So if you have any questions, you can uh, also ask them. Um, and um, we um, also would like to take, thank my fund, funding uh, sources. I would like to give a shout out to Kendra Frederick, who actually was the person who introduced me to Intins and kind of changed my professional life after this. I would like to thank Bob, my PhD advisor, for um, teaching me everything I know about NMR, and my postdoctoral advisor, Tom Muir, for teaching me everything I know about these tools. Um, and we are also hiring. We are looking for a postdoc with synthetic background to come and do DNP with us. Um, so if you're interested in these kind of things and you have some uh, synthetic background and you want to learn more NMR or DNP or biochemistry, please uh, send me an email. And uh, now I'm done and I'm really sorry for going over time. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Gal, for this really comprehensive and informative tutorial session. And I think, you know, we still have uh, uh, around 60 uh, attendees hung in with us. Uh, so I'm personally not too worried about the you go over time. So uh, that is fine. Let's try to um, get some of the questions answered. Uh, I apologize in advance that we might not have time to go through all the questions. So I'll probably just uh, uh, select a few, especially those top voted ones. So let's start with the first question from uh, Vic. How do you decide where to put the tags? Uh, what amino acids? Um, so where to put the tags? Um, which tags are we talking about? Well, I, I guess that question was, uh, uh, was raised when we were talking about the cysteine. Therefore, I'm thinking of cysteine as an example. Um, so where, how do you decide where to put the tag? Um, right, so mm -hmm. first of all, if, if, you, if we're talking about cysteine chemistry, right, um, you might want to see whether you have a native cysteine that you, you can target uh, and that doesn't affect the structure of the protein. So that's where I would start. If, um, if that location doesn't work for you, for example, you want to have a PRE agent that you move around the protein, um, then you want to get rid of that cysteine by mutation and then put cysteines anywhere else in the protein where they don't perturb the structure or you need it in order to um, add the PRE agent. And usually I would choose an alanine or serine residue to turn into a cysteine if I can. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, sometimes for some of our proteins, for example, for HP1, what has worked really well is we have these four native cysteines in there, but they're part of the folded structure. So we wanted to put a fluorescent probe on it. So we just tagged a, a G, um, GS, a G, uh, I forget, a small tri tripeptide tag that has a cysteine in it. And that's much more exposed and reactive. So if you keep your a reaction conditions very quick, then you can just label that particular cysteine and not touch the other cysteines. So there's a lot of exploration, a lot of protein engineering you can do if we're talking about the cysteines. Yes, uh, and I also saw two questions actually uh, related to uh, the cysteine to alanine. So basically, could you elaborate more on the the self uh, the sulfur? So the sulfurization reaction conditions for converting cysteine to alanine. Uh, okay, so I had them over here. So, I mean, they're relatively mild. So um, you just need TSEP because you want to keep everything reduced. Um, and then you need some radical, where is it? You need some radical initiator um, and then um, you can do these, you, you generally do those under, you know, aqueous solution, normal conditions, um, but it does, uh, does require uh, doing HPLC, a second HPLC purification if you want to remove those. Um, so people also have uh, volatile tiles. So one thing that, that we used to do when I was a postdoc um, is we would uh, do the native chemical ligation and build this H4 protein and instead of 
purifying it first and then doing native and then doing desulfurization, we would just add this uh, volatile tile <laughs> um, and then it would, you know, um, re basically evaporate itself over time. It smelled really bad. That's one disadvantage for these reactions. If, you know, if you use those volatile tiles, you better do them in a hood because they smelled really bad. Um, but then it would just, you know, gradually disappear and then you could, you know, either skip the HPLC purification or just get away with one HPLC purification. But those were just done under normal aqueous conditions. And there's different options for this. Yeah, I guess uh, probably for more technical details, I would encourage you to direct those questions uh, to Gala or maybe her students and to discuss more. So let's continue yeah, with the other questions. If you're interested in doing this, I can share my protocol from, you know, my previous work. Yeah, thank you very much on behalf of the attendees. And um, so next question is, uh, what are the causes for the loss of protein during the native chemical ligation? Um, well, the causes are that you just, um, well, first of all, you are trying to put two proteins together right, then um, usually the way it works best is if you have excess of one compared to the other. So actually here, uh, you can probably see it best. So even though I have the same milligram amounts, <laughs> um, this is, I have twice as many moles of this because this is one, uh, one half of the length compared to this one. So I put this guy in excess so that I can really make, use up all of this piece. Um, so I can bias the reaction to as much completion as possible, at least use up one of the pieces. And then really most of the losses come from purification because when you do HPLC purification, you lose. And then if you do desulfurization again, you can lose again, um, unless you do them together in the same pot. So then, then you will lose less. Uh, but so, uh, the, and also sometimes these uh, constructs are not so well behaved. So H4 without its end terminal tail is actually really poorly behaved, even in guanidinium or urea. So the losses come from proteins being unhappy and proteins being purified several times. Okay, uh, I noticed that the ASIF also want to, do you want to make any additional comments on this? Oh, you notice what? Uh, as if who is uh, on our panel list, I oh, okay. yeah, also yeah. want to make yeah. more comments. Do you, do you want to make any comments, as if? Uh, or I don't know, maybe it's a technical issue, but let's uh, probably move on. Uh, so the next question we got it from uh, Adel Charing Var. Okay, sorry if I mispronounced the name. Uh, is entering tag cleavage reaction more efficient than inserting a specific protease cleavage site and cleaving off the tag? So that's for the tag that you are producing. Um, I mean, so yes and no. It depends on what you have at the end of your protein. So sometimes it's actually even too efficient. So if you do this with ubiquitin, the problem is ubiquitin has two glycines at the end, and that's a very easily hydrolyzable linkage. So ubiquitin can be very easily hydrolyzed, which makes it hard to actually, you know, keep it from hydrolyzing before you want it to hydrolyze. So you can use the, you can lose the protein before you get it on the column. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a proline at the end of your extein, this hydrolysis reaction is <clears throat> not very efficient at all. So it's not going to be very easy to do. So it really depends on the context of your protein. Um, sometimes it's too easy and sometimes it's too hard. But for some proteins, you know, and depending on what you want to do, it, it, can, it can just be a very nice quick way to purify your protein and not have to make def protease separately. Okay, good. Uh... So let maybe I'll try to address this question first. Do you need to refill the protein after native chemical ligation? Uh, what about, so sorry, can you say it again? Do you need to refill the protein after native chemical ligation? 
yes, if you do HPLC purification, you have to refold um, because you end up with lyophilized protein and then um, you need to, to put that into buffer. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, another question from uh, Whitney Hostel. Uh, have you seen any rules or trends of where to put a natural amino acid with food incorporation or yields? So because we use a lot of lysine-based uh, natural amino acids, we try to find a lysine residue <laughs> somewhere. Um, so that's our first strategy. They are tolerated sometimes at other positions too, but that if I were to start, I would look for convenient lysine somewhere. And you also don't want to put it at the very beginning of the sequence because then you have problems with translation initiation. So you, you need to maybe start five residues and further in. And I would make like a bunch of different constructs and try them all and see which one expresses the best. Um, so that, that would be my strategy for this. Um, if you're using a tyrosine based in natural amino acid or phenylalanine, then by all means, you know, start with those amino acids first. Um, so try to keep it as, as close to the native as possible. All right, uh, and the next question is, I think it's a, a little bit more general. What is the efficiency of these modifications, I think, in general, and how do you purify non-modified protein from modified protein when the label is very small? Uh, so I guess, um, it depends what we're talking about. So for example, for methylation, um, the reaction actually goes pretty much to completion. So we always run it through HPLC, but by mass spec, we can confirm that it's, we always have the methylation mimic. Um, so if we're talking about a natural amino acid incorporation, um, you need the tag at the end. So if it makes the full length protein, it will also make your tag. Um, if it makes a truncation, it's not going to have the tag. So you just use affinity purification to purify your full length um, modified protein from the truncation, uh, protein, the truncation versions. And actually, this is where we use intines a lot. I would just put the natural amino acid here, have the intine, have the his tag, run it through the column, do the hydrolysis, and end up with my modified protein over here without um you know without any extra <laughs> uh, purification steps so mm -hmm. um for those of you who are interested we actually wrote the um a very detailed protocol in methods in molecular biology doing exactly that um so a natural amino acid incorporation um some considerations there like practical aspects to optimize and using intines as a tagless protein purification strategy so um, so if you're interested, you can take a look at this uh, protocol. Um, All right, uh, great talk. What are your DMP enhancement values in targeted radicals? Ah, okay, so those are the slides that I skipped. So thank you for this question. Yeah, maybe um, so Right, so first of all, here we're using Totopol and we're working at 600 megahertz. So our enhancements with Totopol under these conditions are around 30. Like that's the conventional way where you add 10 millimolar Totopol, one millimolar protein. Now, if we switch to one millimolar protein with this polarization agent attached to it, our enhancement actually didn't go down that much. It was about 24 or something like that. Um, and then there's also benefits if you're working at faster MAS, um, the difference between the enhancements actually uh, becomes even smaller. Um, now, if you start working at much lower concentrations, so we tried this approach with, you know, tiny amounts of protein, five to 10 micrograms, then you can see that the enhancements go down in that case. So you work with about you know, five to 10 um, in terms of enhancement. So it's very concentration dependent uh, as well. So yeah, so there is, um, you know, some crossover between, depending on the concentration, one modified protein can, the polarization can actually travel to the other protein uh, if, if you're working at high concentrations and at low concentrations, you eliminate that. So then this is more true to the natural enhancement you're getting. 
But again, keep in mind, this is Totopol. It's not the best polarization agent, but it's the easiest to make. That's why we started with it. Uh, okay, there are uh, only a few questions left. I, I would probably say let's finish all these questions, but not taking any more questions. Is that okay with you, Gala? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, uh, let's try to wrap it around. Uh, the next question is, uh, in what situations would you suggest using entering versus sorted methods for segmental labeling? What factors might take one preferable over the other? I think you already addressed some of the questions, but maybe elaborate a little more or you know highlight a few key points. If you could. Yeah, I mean, so for for us, we um, primarily use teens. I actually have to be honest, and I don't have that much experience with sortes. Um, because I was trained in a lab that was an in-team lab, so uh, it was our go-to uh, methodology. But I think um, the advantage of in is that, uh, at least with the CFA GP in -teen, you can um, do, you can basically really expand the scope of proteins that you can uh, segmentally label. And um, I'm usually okay living with a cysteine scar compared to, you know, living with a nine residue scar. So, uh, so for that reason, uh, we almost, I mean, we exclusively use intines in my group. But now sortes, I think would be really great if you wanted to attach things to solid supports or attach something to, um, to a cell, whether it's a labeled protein or some other type of tool where you can um, you know, manipulate do some some type of bio have some type of biotechnology application. Um, also, sortes uh, would be useful if you have you know, like I guess with intines sometimes we do this chemistry in cells where we supply a synthetic intine piece uh, to the cell and making this synthetically because the intines are quite long can be problematic. <laughs> so sortes allows you to work with smaller synthetic pieces. So that's one advantage. But for segmental labeling, um, we mostly use intines for those two advantages that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and the next question is, uh, compared to cysteines, are there any other amino acids that uh, people use the commonly for other uh, similar ways uh, for, for site-directed labeling, uh, or even do the same to post-translational modifications? Yeah, so there's, there are chemical approaches to modify other amino acids. Um, I didn't obviously have time to cover. There's a, like some work on lysines. They have unique reactivity. So if you had a lot of exposed lysines and you wanted to all label them in some way, uh, you can. There are reactions specifically that will target the lysines. Um, so yeah, so it's just that usually you have a lot of lysines on a protein, but if you're targeting surface exposed residues versus, you know, things that are, you know, hidden <laughs> from view inside the protein, um, you can still do it in somewhat selective way. So yeah, there are some approaches and I recommend take a look at that review that I mentioned. I, I, do, I did cover some of that. Uh, in the review. Uh, the next question is, uh, in tagless protein purification, why does the hydrolysis occur specifically there? Could that take place in another part of the protein? A question from uh, Ori Lasky. Um, so it takes place there because, um, because cysteines, right, they, they like to do reactions uh, at their termini. <laughs> So they, they will take a cysteine nucleophile if they have it. Um, but in this case, you don't have a thiol or any other you know, nucleophile. In fact, actually, I forgot to mention, but you, you mutate out um, this, asparagine site, uh, this asparagine over here. You turn it into an alanine. So it cannot actually you know, perform the, um, the, the intine chemistry. So in the absence of that, it can also it, then then it uses uh, hydroxide to to basically cleave, and um, so yeah, it, it's specific because of the intine fold and where that hydroxide is allowed to go, uh, which is right at the junction between the two proteins. 
All right, great. The last question, I think it's also about the specificity of the cysteine reaction. Uh, you already addressed some, but here Thomas Schmidt asked, in addition, in a construct with the two or more cysteines, is there a way to protect a cysteine from modification while performing a chemical modification on another ones? Yeah, so there, there are ways to protect it. Um, so there, it, it really depends on the context. You can do it with the natural amino acids. You can do it with um, uh, chemical approaches, depending on how you're making your protein. So there are some ways. They usually require more purification steps and a little bit more work. Um, but usually the best protection, as I, as I mentioned, is if that cysteine is already doing something within a folded part of the sequence, then usually if you have cysteines that are more in disordered or exposed parts, they can react a little bit more selectively. Also, terminal cysteines have unique reactivities, so you can definitely target those without doing too much for, the, for other cysteines within the sequence. So, so there are ways, some, some easier, some harder. <laughs> um, definitely people have used those in different contexts. Yes, actually, I also have a question alongside with this question. Uh, I, I saw in one of your constructs, uh, you label the cysteine on the side of uh, alpha helices. Uh, and I wonder, is it better to kind of modify a residue uh, near the alpha helix that is spacing out or, for example, in the loop, which is apparently more solvent exposed, but maybe more flexible? What is, what's your take there? Well, it depends what you want to do, right? If you're mm -hmm. doing some type of PRE experiment, then you want to put the, the PRE or the you know, EPR at a well-defined position and the more rigid position might be more informative for the chemistry you want to do. While, you know, certainly maybe a loop might be more accessible, but might not be what you want to do. So, um, yeah, so, it, I think this, the answer to this question really depends on what you want to do with the construct afterwards. Yeah. But so, if purely from, let's say, a label and efficiency perspective, do you have any experience? Is mm. it going to increase the reactivity, for example, if you label it at the loop? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Again, it depends. Like for ubiquitin, I probably, because it's so small and like if it's really facing out <laughs> i don't know if you will see huge differences in reactivity now if you had like a really big folded protein where you know there's a lot of things going on and then a dynamic tail like for example in the in the nucleosome where you know if you put a cysteine in the nucleosome core that would definitely be harder to target compared to a cysteine on the on the histone tail that's you know flopping around and available for chemistry so yeah i think Generally, yes.